Top of the morning to you and welcome to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Olumide Macaulay. The headlines. Flashes and explosions over Kiev as Russia launches exceptionally intense air raids. Plus, Poland receives HIMARS rocket launches to strengthen NATO's eastern flank, which borders Belarus. For the first time, Russia claims downing of British Storm Shadow missile. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Russia launched an exceptionally intense air attack on Kiev in the early hours of today using drones, crews, and probably ballistic missiles as the Ukrainian capital suffered its eighth air raid this month. Footage shot overnight shows flashes and explosions over Kiev's skyline. Serhii Popko, head of Kiev City Military Administration, said the maximum number of attack missiles in the shortest period of time were detected and that the vast majority of enemy targets in Kiev airspace had been destroyed. After a week-long hiatus, Russia in late April resumed its tactic of long-range missile strikes and has launched a flurry of attacks in recent days, often targeting Kiev. Meanwhile, Russia's investigative committee released a video and still photos showing the extent of damage to a barbershop in the Russian-controlled eastern Ukrainian city of Luhansk, where at least seven people, including senior local officials, were injured in an explosion. Now, local media reported that Igor Kornet, the Moscow-installed acting interior minister of the self-proclaimed Luhansk People's Republic, was in hospital, connected to a ventilator, having suffered head injuries. After that explosion, the Russian investigative committee opened a criminal investigation into the attempted murder of a law enforcement officer. Kanet has been serving as interior minister of the self-proclaimed Luhansk People's Republic since 2014. Ukrainian military released drone footage, purportedly showing a Russian shell depot exploding in a village near Bakhmut. Ukraine hailed its first substantial battlefield advances for six months. Since last week, the Ukrainian military has started to push Russian forces back in and around the battlefield city of Bakhmut, its first significant offensive operation since its troops recaptured the southern city of Kherson in November. And Ukraine said its troops struck areas where Russian personnel and equipment were deployed. The Russian Ministry of Defense said its air defense forces also intercepted multiple rockets fired by the U.S.-made hippocampus, that's the multiple rocket launcher system, as well as the HAM, that's the anti-radiation missile. Meanwhile, the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine said on the same day that the Ukrainian army continued to fight Russia in Bakhmut and other places. Meanwhile, Russia said that its troops for the first time shot down a British Storm Shadow cruise missile fired by Ukrainian troops. Russia's defense ministry said in its daily briefing on the Ukraine conflict that it had shut down the cruise missile, as well as shorter-range U.S.-built HIMARS launched and HARM missiles. Britain is the first country to publicly supply Kiev with long-range cruise missiles, which will allow Ukrainian forces to hit Russian troops and supply depots far behind the front lines as it prepares for a major counteroffensive. Moscow said on Sunday that Ukraine had used the missile to strike industrial sites in the Russian-controlled city of Luhansk in eastern Ukraine. A mortar unit of an elite infantry brigade prepared under the beating May sun of southern Ukraine for a counteroffensive that could define the country's future. <laughs> In the fields of the country's region, called Dnipro Petrovsk, soldiers practice assembling and packing away their mortar launches to maintain their combat readiness. The mortar unit is part of the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade an elite outfit which fought brutal battles against Russian-backed militia in eastern Ukraine since 2014. The 128 have also fought on several front lines against the Russian army since the full-scale invasion began in February 2022. Kiev says regular Russian units also took part 
and some of those battles something Moscow denies. Ukraine is now seeking to turn the tide of the conflict as it touts an impending counteroffensive. Poland has received its initial batch of Hamas rocket launches. The Polish Defense Minister Marius Blacksek said the equipment will be immediately incorporated into the National Army and will be deployed to the northeast of the country to strengthen NATO's eastern flank, which borders Russian ally Belarus. The U.S. State Department in February approved the potential sale of long-range missiles, rockets and launchers to Poland, including 18 Hamas launchers. Now, earlier this month, Marius Blacksack, Minister of National Defense of Poland, announced that Poland will establish a service center for HIMARS rocket launches in 2023 and is negotiating the details of an order for 500 more launchers. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says he hopes to create a death coalition after Britain promised to support long-range attack drones when he visited the country yesterday. Zelensky met the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at the British leaders' Checkers country residence, where the pair discussed Ukraine's request for Western fighter jets. Zelensky's short visit came following stops in Rome, Berlin, and Paris during a European tour aimed at securing new weapons for Ukrainian counteroffensive against Russia. Britain said it will begin basic training of Ukrainian pilots this summer, hand in hand with UK efforts to work with other countries on providing F 16 jets. We want to create this uh, jets coalition, and I'm very positive with it. We spoke about it, and I see that in the closest time you will hear some, I think, very important decisions, but we have, we have to work a little bit more on it. Yes, look, we, we are going to be a key part of the coalition of countries that provides that support to Vladimir and Ukraine. Now, it is not a straightforward thing, as Vladimir and I have been discussing, to make build up that fighter uh, combat aircraft capability. It's not just the provision of planes, it's also the training of pilots and all the logistics that go alongside that. Now, the UK can play a big part of that. One thing we will be doing, starting actually relatively soon, is uh, training of Ukraine. Ukrainian pilots, and that's something that we've discussed today. We're ready to implement those plans uh, in, in relatively short order, which will mean that we're training Ukrainian uh, citizens to become absolutely combat-ready aircraft pilots, uh, and particularly whether it comes to NATO tactics as well, because that's an important part of the long-term relationship between our countries. So we've had very good productive discussions on that today. Other countries are involved. I'm talking to those leaders. I'll be doing more of that this week in my international engagement, and we're very keen to build that coalition of countries to give uh, Vladimir and his people the aircraft support that they need. When Vladimir was last here some months ago, I talked then about the provision of long-range weapons because of the capability that they would offer. Uh, I'm pleased we we're the first country to be able to do that, and I'm pleased that they will make a difference to the defense of Ukraine. And we will keep providing support, as you've Thank seen you. today, with long-range offensive drones, for example, uh, more anti-aircraft, uh, and there will be further support to come, and that's what we've been talking about today. But I think it's important for the Kremlin to also know that we're not going away. Right? We are here for the long term. We remain steadfast in wanting to defend Ukraine, not just now to reclaim its rightful territory, but also to ensure that Ukraine has the means to defend itself into the future as well. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Now, meanwhile, Russia takes an extremely negative view of Britain's decision to supply Ukraine with those and even more military hardware, such as the long-range attack drones, but does not believe London's help will change the course of the conflict. Asked about Britain's military aid, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said, Britain is trying to be one of the leading countries which keeps pumping weapons into Ukraine says the impact of Britain's military aid will not be significant and will be ultimately only make things worse for Ukraine. He adds that it cannot have any significant or major impact on the course of the special military operation. NATO Secretary General John Stoltenberg said he expects allies to agree on a multi-year program to help Ukraine advance towards NATO 
military standings at the July summit in Vilnius. Speaking at the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Democracy Summit via video link, Stoltenberg says NATO will help Ukraine move towards NATO membership. Ukraine is striving for eventual NATO membership as it acquires advanced Western systems from supporters in the alliance to fight off the Russian invasion. Stoltenberg says he plans to leave his post as NATO Secretary General when his tenure ends in October. I also expect that we will agree a multi-year program for Ukraine where we will work on how to um, um, help Ukraine to transition from Soviet era standards, uh, doctrines, equipment to NATO standard uh, doctrines uh, and equipment and to be and, and to become fully interoperable uh, with NATO. And of course, uh, to do that um, also helps them to move towards NATO uh, membership. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, I also strongly believe that all allies will uh, uh, state that, of course, the most urgent task now uh, is to ensure that uh, Ukraine prevails, that President Putin do not, does not win this war. Because it's only if Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent nation in Europe that, they, uh, that there's any meaning in discussing uh, when and how Ukraine can become a, a member of the alliance. Exactly what kind of framework, I cannot tell you now. Uh, what I can say is that if NATO allies, and especially, of course, uh, the big ones starts to uh, issue security guarantees uh, uh, bilaterally to Ukraine. We are very close to Article 5. Uh, so this is a, this. There is no way, way to, to to find a, an easy solution uh, to these issues. The most important thing is to be very strong in our support to Ukraine, uh, so uh, Ukraine uh, prevails as a sovereign, strong, independent nation in Europe. We will also engage with our Asia-Pacific partners. Uh, for the second time in our history, we will invite the heads of state and government from Japan, South Korea, New Zealand and Australia to participate. And this demonstrates that uh, we realize that what happens in Asia, in the Pacific, matters for NATO, uh, and therefore we have strengthened our partnership with them. Well, also, I have made it clear that I, I have no other plans than to to uh, to leave uh, this uh, this uh, fall. I will be in, uh, almost twice as long as uh, as originally planned, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's what I have to say about that. Now we're pleased to speak with Ambassador Joseph Ayalogu, Nigeria's former ambassador to Switzerland. He joins us virtually from London. It's good to have you with us this morning. Morning, Larry. This gentleman, Jan Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, who's just been speaking, uh, is talking about a multi-year plan to help NATO receive Ukraine as a member. If there's anything that seems to be very difficult, it seems to be NATO membership. Um, and it's one of the bones of contention of Russia. Where they do not want Ukraine to join NATO. What is your view of how uh, this is unfolding with NATO not taking any kind of conciliatory role and insisting that uh, Ukraine does join NATO? Well, um, let, let me put it this way. You, they thought the, the idea of uh, Ukraine joining NATO uh, was a lot far-fetched before. The, uh, the outset uh, or, you know, the special military engagement that Russia went into. Um, it, it, it wouldn't have been one of the things uh, the other NATO members would have been talking of rushing into, or even talking about it at all in, in, in the open. But now we can hear a lot more talk about um, Ukraine joining the NATO uh, Defense Alliance, and I will put it all to the decision by Putin to deal with his problems or concerns in the region, well, in, uh, in, in Ukraine and all the other parts of the former Soviet Union through aggression. So that, that's, that's the point that needs to be made. Um, listening to Stoltenberg, well, he, he, he presents the op, or option, the po possibility of uh, 
entry, uh, Ukraine's entry into NATO. But I can also hear that he, he says it's going to be a gradualist approach. And uh, uh, he, he even mentioned some uh, bilateral engagements, uh, security uh, engagements with Ukraine um, as uh, possible first steps. I, I, I think that's what I heard. So these are all possibilities. Ambassador, do you think Ukraine should insist on joining NATO in the interest of peace? Further down the road, when there are negotiations, do you think Ukraine should concede that and give it up? Well, I, I, yes, it's possible, but Ukraine has a dilemma. It's, it's dealing with an existential situation. If it didn't have Russia's Putin and or Russia's uh, Putin's Russia, Pressing this aggression and uh, going for a kill, we we still haven't had Putin withdrawing. He said it's talking of uh, more 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 conquest and so on. Um, you find that Ukraine uh, sees itself almost unable to take any other decision but to push towards joining NATO. Uh, NATO. So that's how I say it. Uh, it would have been a nice thing if somehow we hear Putin saying, all right, no more wars, uh, no more battles. Then you begin to uh, negotiate whether the issue of whether uh, Ukraine joins NATO or not. But as it is now, if Putin continues to push for uh, aggression, defeat, conquest, and keeps Ukraine worried about its very own existence as a sovereign country, then I think uh, we, we would have difficulty uh, getting uh, Ukraine to withdraw or stop thinking about joining it. For a country that is having a lot of problems making headway in their aggression in Ukraine, it seems uh, the existential threat that you just mentioned in your submission and which European leaders have also mentioned uh, is maybe um, far fetched. No, the existential threat is not far fetched. It's right here. It's 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 right with them. They have uh, had their towns bombed, deaths, and then there's no there's no talk of withdrawing. There's no talk of relenting by the aggressor. So uh, we need to begin to hear talks of uh, a withdrawal or an end of this uh, so-called uh, well, special operation, which, of course, is a war. That's what the, uh, that, 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 that actually should help matters. I think that's, that should be simply logic. Um, I don't know how it's going to come up. Uh, China is set out to, to do some negotiating and middleman duties, but uh, uh, yeah, he, China faces a challenge in that area uh, because he, China also has, finds it difficult to, to specifically urge Putin to withdraw. Uh, you almost feel like China is uh, just giving a slap on the hand and uh, allowing that that aspect to feel to to flow uh, to uh, to flow freely, and uh, not coming out to really make sure that Putin starts talking of a withdrawal. But let's see how uh, the Chinese uh, overtures uh, uh, efforts uh, pan out. Speaking of China, I don't understand France's position. I thought they were taking a more pacifist role. Maybe you could help enlighten us because. And recently, Macron and Jinping are speaking, and uh, France is seeking uh, Chinese collaboration in areas of the economy and what have you. But here is Macron saying he's sending cruise missiles, and, and they seem to have done an about face to support Ukraine as much as the UK have been. You mean uh, France? France? France, yes. Yeah, France. Well, France. France is part of NATO. France is part of uh, uh, core Europe. France uh, believes, like the rest, that 
uh, um, that uh, Ukraine has to be helped, assisted to defend itself. And anything that uh, is supposed to help that defense, uh, I can you can understand why why France would be put, giving whatever it it can give. And there's a lot that Ukraine needs, which it is not getting yet because. Uh, uh, they they still worried about not escalating the war too much, but you see, as Putin persists in trying to crush uh, 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 Ukraine, then some of the countries, for instance, uh, France, will be bringing in whatever supports that are needed. That, so that that is the concept, I, I context I see. Uh, Macron's uh, input, recent input on this matter. So now that's a definite policy shift from a more pacifist role. Well, would we say that uh, France who is, is pacifist? No, France has been playing it the way the EU and the rest of the NATO has. Just that we hear more about. Uh, uh, well, in terms of uh, degrees of participation, we can say, well, uh, UK, Germany, but we wouldn't say that, uh, uh, well, you talk of pacifism, yes, every, all, 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 the net, all the European countries want a pacific arrangement, that is peace. But in the absence of peace and the and an indication of that there is no clear ingredient that will lead to that peace, at least in the in the immediate future, in, uh, which is uh, of course withdrawal of uh, the Russian aggression. Then, like I said, every European country would chip in, and they are they are doing it uh, in their various with their depending on their various capacities and so on. So I, I wouldn't say there is a shift from uh, France to Macron. It's just a line of what the situation throws up. So it appears that people who are nations, beg your pardon, who are formally trying to uh, play a mediatory role seem to be dropping by the wayside or seem to be maybe shifting their positions a little bit. Uh, let's talk about Iran, who, according to an allegation from the U.S. military, are... Mm -hmm increasing their partnership with Russia to supply weapons. And we know that, we know their history with Israel. And Israel was yeah. early in the conflict trying to speak to Russia. And then, you know, it, se it seems to be, that seems to have lost steam. Israel has its own issues it's, it's, it's dealing with right now. Yes, and that's the point. It has, they have their own issues, you know. But one thing that makes it's a little bit rather difficult for uh, obvious support of Russia is the fact that Russia is an, aggress an aggressor country and has broken rules of international relations. So very few countries really feel too comfortable about that. Yeah, Back to China, yeah. Back to China, who's yes. sending a, an envoy uh, to go around and uh, speak to the Ukrainian people, speak to the Russian people. I thought this was my aha moment. Okay, we, we know that China, after the Xi Jinping phone call to Zelensky, was beginning to back their words with action. How far do you think this trip by the China envoy will help to simmer things down? Well, it uh, depends on where he is going and what impact those countries have on the war. The single country that has a significant impact on this war is Russia. And what this war needs to stop is to at least stop one of the aggressors, I mean, one of the participants, and it's best to start with the aggressor, especially if the aggressor is, has presented no other option. Uh, if if if, uh, if Putin said, okay, 
don't go, don't join NATO and we withdraw. Then we will now see what is on the table. But that hasn't come up yet. Situation is that Putin is out to to grab Russia, uh, Ukrainian territory. He's done it before 2014. He's he's done it again. Yeah, uh, carved out republic. So. Nobody sees an end to that, and it doesn't help people, uh, any country that would have wanted to uh, mediate uh, or support Russia to, to see how to get about doing it. Anyway, uh, uh, China is trying uh, and is putting out its uh, uh, good offices to do it. That's why it's going around. But uh, we, we would like to know how that comes up anyway. Indeed, um, and for every fatality on both sides, there's a family bereaved in both countries. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure uh, for talking to us this morning. Ambassador Joseph Ayalogu, Nigeria's former ambassador yes, to Switzerland, who joined us from London. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Have a good day. Okay, after the break. China's special representative for Eurasian Affairs and former ambassador to Russia, Li Hui, to visit Ukraine on a peace mission. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. We pick, we pick up where we left off. A top Chinese envoy will begin a tour of Ukraine, Russia, and other European countries in a trip Beijing says it's aimed at discussing a political settlement to the Ukraine crisis. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin told a news conference in Beijing that Li Yi, China's special representative for Eurasian affairs and former ambassador to Russia, will also visit Poland, France, Germany on the multi-day trip, adding that the specifics of his itinerary will be released in due course. Li is the most senior Chinese official to visit Ukraine since Russia invaded in February 2022, and his trip could coincide with the beginnings of a long-anticipated counter-offensive by Ukraine to recapture territory seized by Russia. The visit comes weeks after Chinese President Xi Jinping held a phone call with his Ukrainian counterpart, Vladimir Zelensky, in late April in the first talks between the two leaders since the war. The Kremlin said that it categorically disagreed with French President Emmanuel Macron, who says that Russia had entered a form of subservience with regard to China since being shunned by the West over the conflict in Ukraine. The Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, said Russia's ties with China were those of a strategic partner, and had nothing to do with dependence. The Russian President Alexander Lukashenko inadvertently confirmed that four military aircraft had been shut down over Russia last week near the borders of Ukraine and Belarus, saying Minsk had responded by putting its armed forces on high alert. The incident comes as Ukraine prepares for a counteroffensive against Russia's invading forces. The privately owned Russian news outlet Commerçant reported over the weekend that a Russian raiding party comprising an Su-34 fighter bomber, an Su-35 fighter and two Mi-8 helicopters had been shut down in an ambush near Klinsky in Russia's Bryansk region. It says they'd been due to attack targets in the Chernihiv region of Ukraine directly over the border. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says influential countries such as India, Vietnam, and South Africa balk at criticizing Russia's invasion of Ukraine because they believe international principles are not applied equally. Mr. Scholz made this known while speaking at the Global Solutions Summit in Berlin. 
Why did influential countries such as India, South Africa or Vietnam abstain from the relevant UN resolutions calling on Russia's, Russia to end its illegal invasion? These questions deserve an answer. When I talk to leaders from those countries, many assure me that they are not questioning the underlying principles of our international order. What they are struggling with is the unequal application of those principles. What they expect is representation on equal terms and an end to Western double standards. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all of these claims are always justified. But we must address them if we want to encourage the powers, powers in Asia, Africa and the Americas to join us in building and defending a stable global order. In Hiroshima, the G7 will assure Ukraine of our unwavering support for as long as it takes. Take steps toward creating secure and resilient economies based on partnerships with the global south. And act on the challenges faced by developing and emerging markets ranging from the urgent threat of the climate crisis to the critical need for infrastructure. I will also remain personally committed to, the work, to working towards a more inclusive, more equitable global order, particularly when it comes to our neighboring continent, Africa. United Nations A Chief Martin Griffiths said efforts will continue in coming days to extend a deal allowing the safe Black Sea export of Ukrainian grain, a pact Russia has threatened to quit on May the 18th over obstacles to its grain and fertilizer exports. The final two ships are due to leave Ukrainian ports today under the Black Sea deal. Now, the UN and Turkey brokered the Black Sea agreements in July last year to help tackle a global food crisis that has been aggravated by Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, one of the world's leading grain exporters. At the same time, the UN agreed to help Moscow facilitate its own agricultural shipments. Under President, as you can, humanitarian for the reasons I have set out, I hope you will agree that continuation of the Black Sea Initiative is critically important, as is recommitment by the parties to its smooth and efficient operation. And we will continue to call on all to meet their responsibilities as the world watches us very closely. In recent weeks, and last week in particular, we have engaged in intensive discussions with the parties to the Black Sea Initiative to secure agreement on its extension and the improvements needed for it to operate effectively and predictably. And these efforts will continue and focus in the coming days. The initiative refers to the export of ammonia, but this has still not yet been realized. Over the past month, we have also unfortunately seen a reduction in the volumes of exports moving out of Ukraine's Black Sea ports due to challenging dynamics within the Joint Coordination Centre set up by that agreement of 22nd of July last year in Istanbul, and thus a related slowdown in operations. We call on Putin to stop holding the world's hungry hostage and extend and fully implement the Black Sea Grain Initiative. We again call on Russia to end its attacks on the people of Ukraine and withdraw its forces from Ukraine's territory completely Russia alone has the power to end the war. It senselessly started. Now I would like to speak with Mr. Yekachi Adekoya, CEO, PR24, Risk Management Consulting, joining us from Lagos, Southwest Nigeria. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for having me, and good morning to the viewers. Um, could we begin by asking you why, where you think Russia is at this stage of the conflict with a stalemate in Bakhmut, which seems to be a stalemate, both sides not making too many advances, aside from denying or corroborating that there were certain skirmishes and certain forays in different areas, but the supply lines uh, that the Russians want to destroy are still being held by Ukraine. And no major offensive from Russia. Has their campaign lost steam? 
Uh, thanks for the question. It depends on who you are listening to and um, where you're getting some of the reports from. The reports will suggest from Bakhmut that um, the VVD fighters, um, in collaboration with uh, Wagner, the private military contractors, um, which are born out of the Russian intelligence, uh, military intelligence arm, um, have now reached the final defense line of the armed forces of Ukraine in Bakhmut. Um, Bakhmut, they now control what is now known as the Citadel area. Um, so Bakhmut is on the verge of um, final collapse. Um, Bakhmut is a, it's a matter of um, days, um, not if at all it will collapse. So there's some progress in um, some areas. Uh, it's just what we see for now is some positional fighting along the lines of contact. Um, some parts of the Ad Adifka area, um, some skirmishes around Zaporizhia. Um, so it's all positional artillery drills. And then what you have going on is a war of attrition. Don't forget that Russia still controls over 20% of uh, what is considered Ukrainian territory. And for now, there is no considerable threat to their chokehold on the territory. Now, what we've seen Russia also do is also to go after um, Western supplied ammunition. And we've seen a number of ammunition depots blowing up in Ukraine, just behind the front lines. And it will seem as though the Russians are targeting Ukrainian capability to stage a meaningful counteroffensive, which is why you've not seen the counteroffensive start. And even if you've listened to President Zelensky, and even Zelushny, who's um, the head of the Ukrainian military, who, interestingly, nobody has heard from in the last 14 or 11 days. Um, you will see that Ukraine wants to start a counteroffensive, but they also know that um, having some munition in depth is also very important to wage a successful campaign. Otherwise, um, Ukraine may find itself in a position where it bonds out too early. So. The, we're not seeing the counteroffensive start. Um, Russia, on its part, is gradually escalating. Over last night, we understand that uh, there were um, air raid sirens all over Ukraine, more than 30 missiles or so um, threatening Kiev and storm some landing in Kiev and some parts of Western Ukraine. So uh, this is a war of attrition. Um, no side is um, winning us as yet, but Russia controls territory with the ability to escalate even further. I think that's a fairer sense of things. President Zelensky seems to have been buoyed by the support from the countries such as the UK, France, and other Germany, who are supplying them weapons at the moment. Is there, and there was a top Ukrainian official who says that Russia's defeat, even maybe this year, towards the tail end of the year, will be irreversible as a result of the supply of some of these weapons and their defense and counteroffensive. Is there a danger of Russia being underestimated? So not at all, not at all. Because if you look at the US, um, the leaked Ukrainian um, report, US report on Ukraine, where the Americans have said that Ukraine is likely to run out of air defense by the end of May, we are now approaching. Unmute. Unmute. Could you unmute? Could you unmute your your device, please? Could you unmute your device? Sorry to interrupt you. Could you unmute your device? Sorry, I'm not. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can now. Couldn't hear you for a little bit just now. Okay, apologies. So I, I don't think the, the parties are underestimating um, Russia or Russia is underestimating NATO. Um, what I think is happening is that if you look at the attack on the Kremlin, you just have subtle nudges 
um, subtle irritation on the parts of the parties, um, and in some stance, trying to gouge Russia into a full escalation um, with, with um, perhaps the intention of a full-on um, head-on NATO escalation or maybe some other geopolitical consideration. So I don't think the parties want to see an over-escalation from Russia, which is why you will see more or less sabotage attacks, um, attacks aimed at weakening Russia. If you listen to the German Chancellor, you listen to the um, President Macron, the aim of NATO and Europe is just to forestall another event like this in Europe, not necessarily to determine what happens on the ground in Ukraine as it is today. Um, Russia, remember, has not gone after the civilian infrastructure that makes life meaningful in Ukraine. They still consider Ukraine as their Slavic brothers, uh, which is also causing some irritation for the Russian president in, in Russia. Some some, hard, some hardliners are insisting on the full and total destruction of Ukraine, even leading up to um, the use of nuclear weapons. So um, the, it will seem like um, Russia and under the leadership of President Putin is taking a nuanced approach to some of this skirmish, perhaps um, in its own calculation that um, the will um, of the Western side to support Ukraine may wane over time. So I think that the, the, the plan of uh, Putin is to play long in this war, while the plan of some provocators on the part of um, the West, you also have hardline uh, uh, neocons on the part of the Ukrainians, um, are gouging Russia for a full-on escalation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the destruction of um, the Russian air assets, you, you can see that first, the tactics used was the deployment of American decoy missile systems and the deployment of the um, Storm Shadow uh, missile systems, and then, of course, some manned portable air defense um, systems just in an area where Russia least expected. Um, and some of this action would seem to suggest um, a poking of the Russian bear to uh, further escalate um, this, this crisis, which follows on the attack on the Kremlin, then the attack on Sevastopol, um, which is why you see Russia stalling on the green, green project. So uh, this is a war of attrition. Um, I don't see Ukraine winning. I don't see Russia losing. I also don't see NATO losing. So in between, somewhere there, um, a compromise has to be reached. And, and so I don't think the sides are underestimating themselves. As early as last year in the war, finally, Mr. Adekoya, Russia, if we were to believe the United States military, had lost 55 air, aircraft. And we know how capital intensive it is to purchase those aircraft. Do you, do you see... Um, Russia running out of equipment? Um, for now, Russia, Russia doesn't look like um, it's running a risk of running out of equipment, but it's no mean feat. Um, currently engaged in a war of attrition with over 31 countries at the last count, um, as opposed to what the previous speaker said, um, that Russia lacks support internationally. That's not true. The total um, size of the population um, that are almost in alignment with Russia compared to that of the West, when you look at Iran, India, China, um, the BRICS nations, there's a considerable part of the globe that, um, I mean, like the German Chancellor said, uh, they want a fairer based um, global system, not a unipolar world. Um, so that aside, we, we've had reports of supply of ammunition to Russia from South Africa, from North Korea, obviously from Iran, some supply of systems covertly halved from China. And um, Russia's um, defense industry is already on a war footing. Remember that Russia is a successor entitled to the former Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union all their life uh, prepared for a full-on war with um, NATO. Um, so Russia still has a lot of ammunition um, old um, Soviet Union um, 
stockpiles that it can call upon. Before the start of the war, it was estimated that Russia had over 17 million stockpile of um, artillery, which is why you see that uh, Russia has no run out of um, artillery shells. Um, so the uh, defense industry is already on a war footing. Russia has been a net exporter of these metals, um, systems, military systems, for a very long time um, since the recovery of its economy in the early 2000s. So Russia doesn't seem um, to me to uh, be running out of equipment, though they are beginning to, the war is beginning to take its toll on them. And the okay. danger is okay. at some point, um, yeah, Russia may have to use the nuclear weapon. Okay, thank you so much for your submissions this morning. Mr. Yeka Chadekoya, CEO, PR24 Risk Management Consulting, joined us from Lagos. Thank you for having me. The Kremlin said that it expected cooperation with Turkey to continue and deepen whoever wins the country's presidential election. Now the Turkish president Tayyip Ayogun or opposition rival Kemal Kilish Daroglu appear to have achieved more than 50% of the vote needed to win outright, meaning a second round will be held on May the 28th. The Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says, in his words, we respect and will respect the choice that the Turkish people will make. And in any case, we count on our cooperation continuing, broadening and deepening whoever wins the country's presidential election. And Ini John Mekwa, our business correspondent, joins us on the program this morning. Ini, good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. It's always important to see how the world of business is affected by this conflict. Yeah. What is the main salient issue at this time? Well, I think, Konova, yesterday we talked about how the RAN, uh, South Africa, has nosedived. Uh, today we'll be looking at the ruble. The ruble has also reduced in value. And um, a, a lot of things are putting up to this. Uh, we do know that oil prices are getting stoned or caned from different angles, and we see it's reducing. Uh, I think by this morning, we saw Brent at 75. That's uh, very uh, slim for Nigeria, for instance, because our budget, 2023 budget, has the benchmark at 75. So we're very close on the edge there. It means just one slip away, and then we're, we're off the benchmark, which is risky for us. That means I Revenue won't, that means our deficit, our budget deficit will be higher than what is even more than the 10 trillion and all of that. But right. uh, I mean, looking at the at the uh, at the ruble this morning, uh, we also know that oil is a major revenue for Moscow for Russia. So even though they are being, they have the cheap oil going on for China and India and all of that, we still see it affecting their budget affecting um, their money, that is the ruble, because we also see the G7 looking at ways of enforcing the third party or secondary sanctions on Russia. So yesterday we also talked about the risk of second sanction on South Africa, which is one of the reasons why investors are running away from that. So if you have uh, more implementation of the secondary sanctions, that means that more more people will run away from doing business with Russia. Um, even the cheap oil might get even cheaper. So all that is, is weighing on the economy, weighing on the ruble at this time. So yesterday we saw the ruble really drop to as low as it was, I think about a year ago or so. And um, their deficit, their budget deficit now is going to about $40 billion. That's a whole lot for them to fund. So even though their central bank governor is doing a wonderful work, you know, trying to uphold the economy, looking for ways to fill up those gaps that have been left by Western corporate companies that used to operate. And we see the collaboration with India. We see them, you know, also going to India to um, uh, start some companies that will encourage India to do more business with them and also try to cover those niches that the Western, you know, talk about the automobile industry, talking about the autocraft industry and all of that. But we still see that the sanction is hitting on a Russian economy. And uh, if Russia wasn't strong,
strong. We do know that it wouldn't have stayed this long. But I mean, they've been able to hold up the hold up this long because the their resources. I mean, you talk of wheat, you talk of fertilizer, and all of that. They've really grown it. But I guess no country is an island. You know, as they say, the world is intertwined in every way. Yeah. Now the EU decree will replace member states' respective bans on. Ukraine grain imports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've been talking about how farmers around the European Union have been complaining because um, the concession given to Ukraine wheat uh, has made it cheaper in Europe. So uh, they've removed a lot of duties. Uh, not just wheat, I beg your pardon, grain generally. So there's uh, uh, flour, there's soybean and all of that all put in together. So those uh, grains from Ukraine have ended up because of the, you know, the, you, the yeah. grain deal that we are yet to settle. We don't know what's going to happen from the 18th. So they've settled around Europe, European countries. And it's now cheaper than countries like Hungary, Poland, Slovakia. Those countries, they normally would eat what their farmers produce. But with a cheaper one, consumers will also go for, always go for a cheaper one, as long as the quality is there. So those farmers have been losing out on revenue because sales have dropped for them. And so we saw the governments of those countries bring out that um, uh, ban that they do not want Ukraine grains in their country. So now EU has stepped in. So it used to be like an individual fights. Poland will come and say we're not going to take it and Hungary will come. So now it's now an EU thing that Ukraine grains will not settle in those countries but instead it will be allowed, those countries will be used as a thoroughfare right. for it to go to other countries. The problem with that is, is that how much capacity do their ports or their transportation or logistics system have to be able to transport uh, a whole of the Ukraine's grain to other parts of the world, which is why the grain deal is still a very important one. And yeah, uh, we, we hope, see talks. We hope that Russia comes around at the end of the day. Yeah, well, Thank Russia will say we hope that the EU also comes around and give them their concession. True. <laughs> Any John Mecca. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. And finally, on the program. Ukrainian boxers fought a series of friendly matches in the Kharkiv underground station. Local authorities organized a tournament underground due to security concerns as Russian missiles continued to hit the city. For the first time since the beginning of the war, boxers from two teams, the Ukrainian Olympic team and the Kharkiv team, could compete against each other. Middleweight boxer name of Yuri Zakhariev says he was preparing for the European Championships at the training camps in Western Ukraine. But within the security of Kharkiv's defenders of Ukraine, Metro Station, Zakhariev fought in a friendly for his hometown dressed in red. As a 2021 World Amateur Champion, he was one of the most prominent competitors in the tournament. That's where we leave it for today's special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Alumide Mokoli. Do join us again tomorrow.